Today we are in the greenhouse, we're going to have a look round. There are loads of things going on, loads of things to discuss, lots of new developments, lots of changes, bit of a changing of the guard I think, seeing as the temperatures have really improved recently and the light has definitely improved and that seems to be the trigger for all sorts of things happening. So I'm going to divide it up into two sections. The first one's going to be the things that aren't going too well because, you know, we're in the real world here. And the second part is going to be things that are promising and going pretty well as of now in April. So let's get started. And we are in. So we're going to start with, not patio magic, that's something to do a little later on. We're going to start with this Lelia Ancept. Now I had this, let's just move my super note here. I had this in a basket in this coconut husk that you can see here. Now my plan was, because this is a creeping rhizome, my plan was to put it sideways like that so that it could put down roots all along the length. Previously, it had been in a pot, so it was kind of stuck like that. And it just didn't, I mean, it certainly bloomed for me. It's bloomed for me several, several times. I've had it, I can't remember, I've lost the label. I think it's probably about three to four years. And it did pretty well for me. I wouldn't say it absolutely thrived, but it flowered and that's the main thing. But you can see things aren't going too well. That dangly root is squishy, it's dead. There are some new roots on it. You probably can't see on the camera, but when you get really close up to it, there are some little green uh, shoots coming from roots. Not really shoots, are they? Some green roots arriving at this time of year. They, it did start to put out uh, a new growth. I can't see where that was now, uh, but that, that blast, oh, there it is on the edge there. Uh, but you can see that's gone brown, that went. So it's certainly not doing really well at the moment. And because of that, I thought, well, let's have a look at what's going on. So what actually happened with this is that it's spent, I'll just turn you around here, it's spent the winter over in that corner. Now, the reason for that is because it's a wide basket, I didn't have much room for it. And of course, again, real world problems here. I totally forgot that it needs tons and tons of light and I stuck it in a shady spot. And I think that on the whole, more than the fact that it was in coconut husk is what's done for it. So I'm gonna to have to make a change. Now, whether I'm gonna stick it back in the coconut husk or not, I'm not really sure. I might try, as soon as we're coming up to summer, to stick it in some moss because I seem to be having quite a bit of success with moss recently. I know that might change as we come to winter again at the end of the year. And I know that if it's in moss, it's gonna need more changing on a regular basis because obviously the moss degrades. I might even try it in some lecker. I've never tried lecker before. I bought a bag about two years ago and I've never used it. <laughs> I might try it in that. So if there's anybody who's actually tried growing Alalia Anceps, in non-organic media please write in the comments and tell me what your experiences are of that especially if you've got a similar environment so that's the lelia anceps don't want to lose that because that is a lovely plant i do believe you can actually grow them like a vanda uh, we are in a very humid place here um, but <laughs> my problem with that is anything mounted i really struggle to get around to watering and they just go too dry even though it's a humid environment uh, so i might try the moss see what happens so that's that there's a couple of other things not going too well this one is a disaster this one is bulbophyllum elizabeth ann buckleberry I made a couple of videos on this way way in the past so i actually had this over in the hothouse and it's been on the floor and it's been totally neglected you can see it looks dreadful there are a couple of new shoots on it never bloomed it did try once but i had it so wrapped up in moss and twine that i actually stifled the bloom and stopped it from from coming so my thoughts were this time some little growth uh, either throw it out or give it another go so i'm really going to try and hydrate it this time you can see these pseudo bulbs are completely desiccated so it is a disaster i'm really not expecting a lot to come from that but i'm going to try i'm going to give it another go other changes my dracula didn't seem to like where it was again probably or possibly not bright enough and i'm not sure that's really a bright enough spot i just thought i'd move it around and have a see what would happen with it i have kept it fairly moist all year round it's not dying it's certainly not got spider mite but it should be 
showing some signs of growth at this time of year and it's not as of yet maybe i'm just not being patient enough so i have repotted a number of orchids and i've put them all in moss so this one here did lose all its leaves at one point so this is rossio glossum grandi there are some new little roots underneath so i thought right put it in moss and i know then that it, it can dry out in its own time i'm not gonna have to water it too regularly but i can see that it's dry when it does actually dry same with my alicera peggy ruth carpenter i've completely stripped all the dead pseudo bulbs and the new growths that were there i've put them into some sphagnum moss so i can see what's going on and i know that that moss will dry pretty quickly uh, over there we've got a few different orchids there that i've done the same thing to it's my accident and emergency space over there and it does seem to work there's quite a few that i've had over there and i've since moved them back over into the main area of the greenhouse when they have actually began to put some growth on for me i think my oncidium sotoanum i'll just move you around here was case in point and it did actually bloom this year so this one got spider mite and completely lost all its roots got it in some sphagnum moss and i know then that it's going to dry out it's very easy to re-wet again and it's put down roots and put some really good growth on and it's looking very healthy now apart from that black pseudo bubble that probably could do with getting rid of at some point it's only in very shallow moss what I will do with that probably in another couple of months is dig that out and have a look how those roots are doing but it looks pretty healthy to me and it might need to uh, be raised up a little bit and give it a little bit more of a root run we'll have to see what those roots look like I do intend on reintroducing some more orchids in here because I lost so many due to the spider mite issue so some more promising things that's happening you can see my two impatiens here are not looking anywhere near as chlorotic as they did before and they're really growing quite large now this one in particular has really put on some green growth and it actually took two lots of fertilizer to do it so first of all i put some little pellets in you can just about see the pellets down there they were a slow release general purpose fertilizer and nothing happened for ages so eventually i stuck in one of the little tablets that i get from dibley's i'll just show you that and i've showed it before one of these things that you put in every month in the streptocarpus and it's happened it's gone nice and green so i take from that the and i've read this before in various botany books that plants will only grow as much as the minimum nutrients that they're getting that doesn't sound quite right i'll try and rephrase that so whatever nutrient it is that they are lacking that will limit their growth that's a little better so they might be getting all the nutrients they need apart from one and just that one will limit their growth so kind of thinking along the lines of well if everything is available to them then none of those things are going to limit their growth so simply by putting a little bit more of the fertilizer into some of these plants or uh, spreading the npk so in other words i've got the npk ratio from the slow release but maybe there wasn't enough nitrogen in there so i've put another tablet in which maybe did have enough nitrogen and it's resulted in this now of course the danger is that i go and burn roots and i know that can happen with orchids but these aren't orchids and i've never heard that this kind of a plant can burn its roots so i thought i'd give it a go and it does seem to have worked fortunately so this one is looking really nice now with loads and loads of blooms I mean, look at that that is nice isn't it it's very unusual as well who would think this is related to busy lizzies the common certainly in the uk anyway the common summer bedding plant so this is an impatiens uh, niam niamensis and um, the one over here as normally what happens when you feed something it puts loads of vegetative growth on loads of leaves on and no blooms however you can just about see in the tips there are tiny little buds forming on pretty much every tip so that's going to look spectacular soon that is definitely going to bloom very very soon i'll just show you down there can you see those little kind of pale green things there's another couple of buds there it's going to happen while we're on this side you can see my bougainvillea has actually come into bloom so this is the first year now bear in mind i've had this for about four years this is the first year that my bougainvillea hasn't been pruned down 
and it's making a start into growth with nice healthy leaves that don't have thrips and don't have spider mites. I mean, they're very, very delicate, these leaves. It's no wonder it loses them all. But we all think of Bougainvillea as being really, really robust, but I suppose it depends on what hybrid it is. So this hybrid is Bougainvillea brasiliensis. These leaves are actually from Amandavilla, Amandavilla laxa, which is uh, a species. I've got a couple of pots down at the bottom with that. So we should have a fantastic, spectacular display of Bougainvillea, finally. And they can even get the sun up there when it comes through on the rare occasion that it comes through. It's nice and sunny today. So this is the first year that I've started from this point. Usually I panic because I always read in the past that Bougainvillea uh, do not lose their leaves through the winter. However, in my case, they do. This one has been out of leaf for four months, and this is the first time I've not panicked over that and cut it right down. Um, they do, they lose their leaves, and I've found that with several plants that are so-called evergreen, non-deciduous plants, that given the right conditions, they can just quite, quite easily actually slip into dormancy and then come back to life again when the temperatures and when the conditions are acceptable for them. So we are going to see a fantastic Bougainvillea display this year. That's probably put the mockers on it, but let's see what happens. So now on to the more promising developments. The Streptocarpus are coming back to life now. You can see most of them have really greened up. There's a couple that haven't quite greened up as much as I'd like, but I think uh, the time has come. You can see a lot of these, these are older leaves, these yellowing leaves here, and I will probably pull those out eventually as the greener, newer leaves in the middle start to come. Um, that's obviously the temperatures are improving now, the light's improving. Once these come into bloom, and it will take literally a couple of days, the spikes will suddenly appear and then they'll all be in bloom and they'll be in bloom right the way through till December until I stop them, because they look such a mess by that point that they really, really do benefit from a real strip back and a, you know, a restart. I did feed these all about a month ago. I'll feed them all again once they all come into spike. Those tablets I showed you earlier are really designed for like a monthly fertilization. And the same along the top there, they're looking, looking much, much better. We do have one tiny bloom down there, but it's, it's nearly over now. I think this was just a rogue one. There was a couple of blooms on that one, but I thought at the time, oh, they're all coming into bloom, but they're not. Brugmansia. Now, this is the best that it's looked at this time of year. Again, thanks to the sulfur hot box. All praise to the sulfur hot box because it's really made a difference. Brugmansia are very, very vigorous. However, mine never has been. <laughs> and the reason is that it always had a spider mite and it always started the season with spider mite. You can see how much healthier these leaves look. I've given this a feed as well, and I do expect to be able to put this out. What are we now? April. I mean, we've really got another couple of months yet before all threat of frost has gone. Uh, I am getting frost at the moment overnight. We had it last night. We had it the night before. That will kill this. So I'll just have to keep my eye on it and try and not let it take over the greenhouse. But it could be lovely to get a really nice specimen of this this year without the terrible effects of spider mite. And same goes for my Insetti over here. I've had that kind of dormant all winter and that's now coming into growth again. So that will be able to go out again in another couple of months. Other promising developments. So both my Dendrobium densiflorum and Thersiflorum, that one's done really well this year. This one's put lots of growth on and you can see up here we have a bud which will develop into a huge bloom, hopefully. I did have one blast on me one year, but last year looked really great. The Thirsty Florum hasn't done as well. It did put a new growth on. Now, whether it's just not quite in enough light over there, there is a difference between where they are. It put a new pseudo bulb up there, sorry, it put a new cane up there, but it lost one of the leaves, which wasn't particularly good, but it does have a little nubbin on there. So maybe I'll get my Thirsty Florum to bloom for the first time. Never been able to get this to bloom apart from the first time I got it. So this one was my Victoria Regina. It has put a cane on, a smaller one, which tells me that it's not as happy as it was previously. Um, I'll have to look that one up and see if there's anything I can do to improve things over there. Other promising developments, carnivorous plants. So I actually removed all the moss from these cephalotus 
because they weren't actually putting any new growth on, they were kind of in a suspended animation. Uh, somebody suggested I remove all the moss. I like them in the moss, you see, and I thought, well, that's pretty natural. However, they didn't like it. And just the fact that the moss has been removed already, we've got new leaves cropping up on here. Leaves come before new pictures do on cephalotus. A little bit of moss there, I don't want to get that back. I'll have to make sure we keep the moss gone. You can see some more new leaves down there. So I'm happy with this, these now. These are hopefully on their way to putting some nice new growth on for me. And who knows, I might be able to divide them again because don't forget these are divisions from what was over here. This is looking great. You can see I've actually fed all my carnivorous plants. I bought some fish flakes. In the past, I've always uh, held back on feeding carnivorous plants, mainly because I kept all my vents and doors open and they, they caught their own stuff. I also fed them with orchid feed. I sprayed them with orchid feed. But this time, this year, I'm not going to do the same mistakes as last year. Last year, I had total infestation through both hothouse and greenhouse. Not going to happen this year because I'm going to keep anything that I have open like this. I'm going to have some kind of covering. I'm going to try and really make sure that nothing comes in. It's going to happen. You know, there's, good, there's little ways of them getting in. They can get in in pots. They can get in uh, underneath. There's all sorts of ways they can get in, but I'm really going to make an effort to not just leave it wide open like I have done in the past. You can see all my carnivorous plants have benefited from the feed. You can see there this Drosera capensis red form is looking particularly nice and this little curled up bit here is where one of the fish flakes fell. I put fish flakes in, in the cephalotus as well. Same with all these different Drosera down here, looking great. Drosera capensis alba looking fabulous, fed that too. Um, I fed this little Hamiltonii, I think it's Hamilton, Hamiltonii down here. That's a new one, my Slackii. That's a new one. That's my Prolifera, looking great. Uh, my King Sunju, Drosera regis, Regia, that's that one there, nice new leaf. And you can see that's curled over, that's curled over, that's all fish flakes. This one here, this one is, what's that one, Modesta, which was a great big tall thing. That does seem to be going over now. I believe that one actually goes dormant during the summer months. So I expect that one to disappear for a while. So that's quite promising. There is a bit of a changing of a guard over here. So you can see that lots of my cyclamen are still looking pretty good, but a lot of them are beginning to go dormant, like this huge one here is beginning to go dormant. That one's still looking fabulous. What I do intend doing with this one, this one and this one, these were ones that I bought uh, at the end of last year and you can't actually see the tubers and people have asked me this question loads of times like where are the tubers and I have a theory I think I mean there's got to be tubers cyclamen don't grow from nothing they all grow from tubers so I expect either to be hidden under the surface um, that isn't actually my what I think is going to happen I'm going to expect there to be lots of tiny ones I don't know I'm going to have a look when the time comes um, but I expect there to be lots of tiny ones and these are kept in such perfect conditions. They are juveniles, the very young ones, and I found the very young ones are very, very difficult to take through dormancy. But we'll see. We'll have a look once they've all gone over. And they will do because the temperatures are getting really warm in here. Don't forget cyclamen come from kind of eastern Mediterranean places. And during the hot summer drought months, that's when they're dormant. And then during the cooler winter months, that's when they come into bloom. And these have been in bloom for mine from right the way from November. And we're now in mid-April. And they're still looking pretty good, but you can see they are beginning to go over. You can see all the spikes that I've cut off. Uh, they are beginning to go over and I will reduce the watering and they then get put over there with those ones over there and different plants come and take their place. And in actual fact, at the moment, it's pelagoniums that are beginning to take their place. So let's have a look at some of these. Uh, that's not a pelagonium. <laughs> that is my dendrobium, probably not kingianum, probably delicatum. That's beautiful, that one, isn't it? So that one is silver glitter, Pelagonium silver glitter, I think. No, it's not. Yes, it is. Silver glitter. You always get these, like, just mostly red, and then the others are the kind of the glittery ones. 
Now, it's a funny one, this one, because it's only tiny and it's never really grown vegetatively for me very well. It's been like that for a few years now. Um, I like the fact that it blooms. And next to it, we have Pelagonium SK Verglo. That's looking fabulous. This was another one that had some kind of either disease, fungal disease, or some kind of bug attacking it. I couldn't see anything with a hand lens, but something was attacking it. As soon as we got the hot box, beautiful green, healthy looking leaves. This one looking great. This one was in bloom quite early, actually. I don't think I have on there. It was, I see I've got cuttings from diseased pelagonium. It's looking a lot better, a lot better than it did before. And I think that was just part of the same problem. Something like Grandiflorum rings a bell. I can't remember. I have got it in another plant, which isn't quite in bloom yet. So when that one comes in bloom, I'll give you the name for that one. Um, this one here, what's this one? Well, that's my, that's my Grand, Grandiflorum Don Diego, I think. I've just got that from looking at it. It just looks like the same kind of hybrid. Um, or is it that? That one might be the same as that one. <laughs> Another no ID one there, looking okay. Now that needs cutting off there, that's over. Another orchid here looking nice, my berry odour. Again, first time this has bloomed for me since its attack of spider mites. It's actually got more blooms on it than I expected. A few cakeys as well. I don't like cakeys. I really try to get rid of them. That one's coming back again. That one's a bit of a funny bloom. It's not quite opened up the way it should have done. I think it's just, it's just not its time yet. It's not ready yet. Um, my little, <laughs> my little, my huge begonia longiciliata here, the hurry one. Let's look at that from a distance there. That's looking fabulous. Very, very, I mean, look at this. Like the, the, young, the young leaves are so hurry. They're just like a mass of hair. That's all they are, just like fuzz. That is nice, I like that. I do like that, if you like that kind of a thing. And over here, my begonia fuchsioides is now really going for it. You can just see some beautiful clusters of blooms here. Looking very nice. So that's about, what's that, about four feet tall now. That's going to, it's a cane begonia, so that's going to go right the way up there if I let it. Um, moving on to some carnivorous plants, loads of new pictures on Berkii and Gaia over there. Looking great. There's a new, new picture forming on there. Another new one over there. My Loei cross with Ventricosa, looking fabulous. And at the back here, we've got some species pelagoniums. This one is going to come into bloom soon. There's a number of them over here. I don't really think these are absolutely fantastic plants to grow for most people. I just like them because they're a little bit different. When they do come out in bloom, they do look really nice, but they're quite straggly, quite messy. Uh, my Ancidium Twinkle, this was another rescue that seems to be doing really well in the moss. I guess this is going to be a while before this one blooms, but I'm just happy to have rescued it. It did go down to practically nothing. Uh, my Prostechia radiata, we're going to get two bloom spikes on that, hopefully. Hopefully they don't blast. It's the first year I've not had any blooms on my Dendrobium nobly. So this was one of the very first orchids I bought. It looks healthy enough. I do think the root is quite root bound down here. The roots are going off in all directions down there. That could be a case in point of when you need to actually uh, repot these things. But I did give it a winter rest. Maybe I didn't give it long enough, but it's, uh, it's whatever reason, it's not bloomed this year, but hopefully next year it'll restart. A couple more Pelagoniums up there, which should come into bloom soon. That one is about to. So that one is, what's that, Tornado, Regal Pelagonium. That'll look spectacular when that comes because that's a gorgeous one. Really love that one when that one comes. It's really slow, you've just missed that one. You'll have to wait for the next video for that one. A couple of Oncidiums doing okay. Sherry Baby, I don't know whether they'll bloom or not. What's that one? That one is Sweet Sugar. I've never been able to get that one to re-bloom. It bloomed for a couple of years and then it just kind of went downhill, but again, it's the spider mites. My Hardenbergia up here. Little tiny, tiny blooms there. That's a little bit of sun damage. That one is actually, if I just bring you around here, it is beginning to grow now. That one 
just kind of slept for the first year. Again, it could have been the spider mites, couldn't it? They just took over everything. Um, it is sold as a conservatory plant, this, and it is a climber. So hopefully that'll really take off for me this year. These little Tredescantia mundula lisa, you've just got to keep pinching out what you don't like on these things. They've got so many different variegations. Um, I found they look a lot better in the light, where you get loads of light on them, loads of warmth on them, and you get much more in terms of pink and uh, variegated leaves. Where anything green, got to come off. Otherwise, there's another nice one there. Otherwise, that's what you end up with. <laughs> Just a pure green form, which I don't mind. It's all right. So more Cheddar Scantia down here. Still looking okay. This is, these are really just like stock pots. I don't really grow them for any other reason. Um, that's looking okay. These will go completely green. You know, that, that, will, that plant will turn into a totally green plant. And as with many Tredescantia, growing them in pots like this, all you end up doing is propping them and chopping them, or chopping them and propping them, indeed, in that particular order. If you leave them, sooner or later they will look a mess. That's just what happens with Tredescantia. You've just got to completely renew them every so often, start them off in a new pot. And if you do that, then everything will be fine. I've got a fern over here. You've probably not seen this for a while because it's been under a bench, but I brought it out into another spot just so I could see it a bit more, really. Terrace Cretica, this one. This one did get scale at one point, but it's fought its way back. Oh, I've not had scale on it since. It looks like something's been on that, some little droppings on that. Probably slug or snail damage. More likely to be slug damage. I've not actually been in here on the night time, which is that's when you catch these things. My other Nepenthes over here, there are tons coming on here now, tons of new pictures. It's like a little nursery of pictures over here. Lots and lots of new little ones coming along. That's got a nice new one coming on it there. Um, these are small plants, to me anyway, you've just got to put up with them until they get to an interesting size. I've got lots and lots of small Nepenthes. Oh yeah, I need to mention this. This better flower for me this year, otherwise it's in Last Chance Saloon. <laughs> so, this one is my Sologeny speciosa. I did mention this in the last video. I said all these pseudo bulbs go very, very wrinkled if you don't really, really soak it every so often. So I've got to leave it in a tray for like a couple of days to plump them up. Uh, and then eventually they all plump up. And this is the first year I've actually kept them plump. So hopefully this will begin to show me some blooms very soon. And if it doesn't, well, I'm going to be having stern words with it. Mandeville I've not talked about for quite a while. I have a couple of Mandevilla in here. So this is a new one that I bought, I don't know, 18 months ago, Sanderi Rosea. It's like a, well, as it sounds, like a rose coloured, uh, like, a, like a pink, pinky colour. It has actually got some new pending blooms there. Those look like they're going to develop into blooms. And it, it hasn't surprisingly been knocked back by the winter months and it's just shooting off around the corner there. And my older one that was covering all this wall will again cover the wall, hopefully. You can see down here, all that's new growth this year and all this is new growth. So it won't be too long, especially since we've got these warmer temperatures now before it starts to shoot up again and we have some lovely new growth. That looks nice with the sun behind it. That picture looks quite slender, look, you can see in there. Doesn't look like much juice in there just yet, but it'll come. Digestive juices will come. Here's something I've not talked about before. So I know I don't normally grow this kind of thing in here, but I thought I'd give it a go. So these are various mint leaves. Um, anybody who thinks mint is mint is mint, well, it's not. We've got various ones. We've got a strawberry mint. We've got a lemon balm. We've got a chocolate mint. We have, what's that one? We have a peppermint. We have, uh, what's that one? Apple mint. So we've got various mints. And the idea is for us anyway, that we use it in cooking or I quite like, like proper fresh mint with hot water on it, you know, like a tea. Uh, I really like that. And if you've ever had those that you can buy in the shops, they're nothing like as good as the real tea, you know, the real leaves straight in a pot. You just put them in like a little strainer chop them up, put some boiling water over them, and I, I quite like that as a, as a drink. 
So we'll finish on a culinary note there. So that's what's going on in here. We really need to look at what's going on in the hothouse as well, because obviously that's the more house planty kind of things. And I still say a lot of these things could be grown in a house. A lot of the things in here could be, but obviously you need cooler temperatures. Now we have rooms like that in the UK that we don't keep as warm as the living room and the dining room. We can see things are definitely changing. It's lovely to see the sun out. It's lovely to see new growth and new things going on at this time of year. So. As always, please tell me in the comments anything that you're interested in that you've seen, any questions that you've got, or I just like learning about other people's experiences as well. That's great to interact with people like that. And for now, I'll see you on the next one. Bye.